Yep, 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 yep. Well, good morning, folks. Welcome back to Shit People Ask Elliot, where you ask me shit and I make a video. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode featuring my new 5x5 training routine. I'll be including squats, deadlifts, presses, and rows in today's workout. And socks when I wear shoes. <clears throat> so I'll begin with front squats. This guy wants to know, what's a good thing to keep you motivated every morning? I've spoken so much about motivation. I, I tend to be a passionate person myself. And early on in my early adulthood, basically when I wasn't as wise as I, my old age has allowed me to be, I would get real excited, motivated, passionate, fiery, fired up about things. And that would just take me to the, to the outer space and then psh, drop down. So I've really, I've discovered over time that motivation really doesn't mean anything. In fact, I get a little nervous when I'm motivated because it means that I'm going too fast and I need to slow down. What really matters is your commitment, discipline, and long-term vision. What are you going to do every single day as a ritual to keep you moving towards that thing that, that you were passionate about to begin with? Set your goals when you're passionate, but be consistent and disciplined uh, in order to get these things done. So I'm not motivated every day, but I'm committed every day, you see? That works a lot better. Uh, this guy wants to know if you can do a muscle up. And uh, he said, can you shout out my girlfriend, Pratiga? Her name's Pratiga from Toronto. What's up, Pratiga from Monto Montego? What was, where, where, where Toronto, was she from? Toronto. Dope from yeah, he wants to know if you do a muscle up though. I've seen your videos that you do them. I've done a muscle up, but I can't do a muscle up. I haven't, I haven't simply practiced it, so not to say I can't, but like I wouldn't be able to do it today. This guy said, what do you think about people's dumb questions? I don't really think any of the questions are dumb. It's a matter of where the person is. And I have to realize, and we all need to realize, that every single day there is a million brand new kids coming to, to the gym and getting involved in weight training and, and sports and health and fitness. So it's a matter of consciousness, a level of consciousness. If you don't know something, you simply don't know something. And asking a question is better than assuming you know or, uh, or not asking at all. So I don't really believe any questions are dumb. <clears throat> What's the best time to deload after you've been doing uh, strength training? When I was training for strongman, and that's when I was abusing myself more than ever, I was really putting in that deep, intense work I would take the fourth week of every month off. So I would go hard one week, hard two weeks, hard three weeks off. A lot of guys thought this was absurd. They were like, well, you really take off that much time? But I was able to develop my greatest amount of strength by resting a full week every month. Now that my intensity is not nearly as high, I find that by just listening to my body, and I find that you know maybe about every six to eight weeks, I need to back off a little bit like I am right now. So I'm not necessarily, uh, quitting training for this week, but you've noticed I've slowly backed off. I'm backing off the volume, backing off the intensity a little bit, and I'll probably do that for a week or two and then jack it back up again. This guy wants to know how often do you keep in touch with uh, your childhood friends and uh, kids that you knew in like high school and stuff like that? I don't have too many childhood friends that I see face to face because I've moved to Florida, but on Facebook we'll communicate or if I go back I'll see one or two of them. Um, the person that I probably stay in touch with the most from my childhood is my college friend Richie Hossein, who you've probably seen him in, uh, on some of my Instagram pictures and stuff. So we played football together at St. John's University. He and I still kind of link up every once in a while and talk on the phone. But uh, 
Most of the people in my life right now are right here, right now. <laughs> Recording this week's Shit People Ask Elliot, snap me a snappy ass question and I'll answer it in the next video. Uh, how you look like that every day, day in and day out? You just gotta be born like me, man. <laughs> I wish I could tell people, but hey, you gotta be born in the right place, the right time. Times You're tough. South Side lawyer. Times are tough. Secret <laughs> <times>. Offices. <laughs> Yo, hey, yeah. so he, makes, he makes it sound so exclusive. Offices, Tampa. Just Tampa? Bro, I was in Jacksonville. There was like offices, Jacksonville. Motherfuckers everywhere. What's the best thing to do on your off days and rest days? Other than rest, obviously. I've made a really good video about this. I think it's called like the five things you should do on your off day, something like that. But in the video, I show how to foam roll, how to relax the tension in your hips and in your belly, how to use deep breathing, and how to stretch in order to recover from all the intensity of your training that week. So check that video out or do as I say. Roll, stretch, breathe. Uh, this guy wants to know, how do I fix falling forward on power cleans? If you're falling forward on your power clean, that's a number of things. Number one, you're probably pulling the bar too far away from your body. When you pull a power clean, you want to bring the bar such that you're almost touching your body. It's so close to you. If you've got it out here, you're going to have to drop forward in order to get it. That's probably what it is. But you can also end up in a situation where when you're in the catch phase, you keep dipping forward like this. And I would say that it's probably because you lack the capacity to maintain thoracic extension. So doing things like front squats, also you might have uh, really tight ankles that cause you to come up on your toes. So number one, make sure that you're pulling the bar close enough to you. Number two, make sure you have the ability to maintain good posture in a front squat. And number three, make sure you're not landing on your toes, you're landing with your hips back and feet flat. Done. I said, what, do you, what did you eat for breakfast? Two whole eggs, two egg whites, four turkey sausages, a cup of coffee. Do you stretch every day, even when you don't train? Yeah, I stretch every single day, whether I train or whether, or whether I don't train. In fact, on the days that I don't train, I spend a little bit more time doing yoga and training to prepare me for the next training phase or also to help me recover from the previous train, train, train workout, working out. I'm retarded today. Yo, Elliot, is becoming a physical therapist good for me or not? Uh, by the way, I'm Egyptian. He said it's a good career to be a physical therapist. That's what he's asking. Physical therapy might be a great education, but I don't know if it would be a great career. Just for me, I mean, I wouldn't want to work in, a con in, a, in the context that would mean I have to receive payment from medical uh, insurance companies or like the government. I'd much rather be a private pay physical therapist. So if you're going to go into it for the education, please do. But if you're going into it for the career, I say study marketing and business building and go into a private pe pre private pay practice and build your own business. Yeah, I'm definitely retarded today. I think I'm just burnt out. Nice guy. 
How many bananas do you eat a day? I only eat one banana a day. I can't even say banana a day. <laughs> Bro, I'm definitely retarded. I only eat one banana a day, and it's during my workout, only for my Snapchat friends. I eat it for you guys. It says, what's the best timing for your meals uh, pre-workout and post-workout? When I was younger, pre-workout really didn't matter to me because I would eat like a giant Thanksgiving dinner and I'd go work out and I'd be just fine. Now it kind of takes a little bit longer to digest. That's why I use digestive enzymes and whatnot. But I've read recent research that says in workout nutrition is also important. So taking in uh, like amino acids and my daily banana all support recovery as well. And then post-workout, I think it's just generally been said I don't know how true it is, but I guess you could call it bro science, that you want to have your post-workout meal within an hour after your, your workout. And then I guess it also depends on your goals, right? Like, if you're trying to be catabolic, like sometimes you're trying to cut weight severely, you might want to even extend that to two hours after your workout. So your goal actually has to come into play also when answering that question. <laughs> How do you fix uneven traps? Oh, good Lord. If I knew how to do that quickly and efficiently, I would have done it because mine are definitely uneven. You got to look at various different factors. Like, for example, I often used to talk about how the role of the atlas in the nervous system what it plays in the activation of left to right muscular contraction, right? So you can have a nervous system imbalance, or in my case, you can have one leg shorter than the other. So for 36 years, or 35 years, if I started walking at age one, I've been walking around like this, sideways and shit. So the muscular system sort of developed to compensate for that. You know, so it could be a, it could be a number of things. Your body is compensating for the imbalances in your nervous system or uh, musculoskeletal system. So, I don't know. You can correct it. If you're a bodybuilder and aesthetics is the most important thing to you, then maybe you could do traps on one, one side to bring it up. That's not to say that it would maintain itself because again, if the root issue, the etiology of the imbalance is it the nervous system or the, or the skeletal system, well then you're doing this all day for no real reason, because the minute you stop doing this, it's just going to go right back to where it was. So, that's like a physiological question, not really a bodybuilding question. <clears throat> Probably done this one a lot, but uh, this guy wants to know, Yo, Elliot, I have a vulture neck due to a lot of time spent in front of the, of the computer. What's the best thing I, I can do for that? We gotta recognize too, your neck, the way your neck is positioned has everything to do with the way your hips and shoulders are positioned. Even your feet, you could have muscular imbalance in your foot that causes your neck to fall forward. Essentially, Paul Check says there's a survival totem pole where your body will, will adjust down below just to keep you, keep your your eyes level to the horizon. So, in other words, say for example, if you have a, a severe anterior pelvic tilt, you're also going to have a kyphosis, and naturally, your head's going to want to go here, so that you would have, you know, it would be like just falling in line with the position of your shoulder girdle, but so that you don't bump into shit, and so that you can see where you're going, you crane your neck up like that. That's why you got the vulture neck. So you can look at it as, well, the deep cervical flexors are weak and, it's, and the extensors are too tight. Sternocleidomastoid is too tight. You can stretch those muscles and strengthen these muscles. But at the same time, if you're still slouching around and forward from a kyphosis, your head's just gonna go right back to that position. So it's a total posture thing. It's not just your, your neck is screwed up, your whole body is screwed up. So work from the ground up. Consider how your body is positioned 
in the foundation and then your head will set properly on the foundation, you see? Right? Because you could have tight shoulders. What does that do right away? You do this, like a lot of people have short biceps and pec minor, and right away you got that crane neck. But look, I go like this, my shoulder drops, my head goes back into its proper position. This guy says, is squat and deadlift enough for uh, core strength? Or should he add some other stuff? I will tell you that if you want to have maximal core strength, yes, you should definitely squat and definitely deadlift. Part of the reason why I took off from squatting and deadlift was to see if, that I, if I could build up core strength without having those uh, compound movements in my training program. And it didn't take but a couple weeks for me to realize it's not working out the way I thought it would. So, of course, you want to include isolation exercises for the deep abdominal wall, for your even the external parts of the abdominal musculature like your rectus abdominis and external obliques. But at the same time, you want to have that integrated stability that's only associated with doing movements like the deadlift. Deadlift, in my opinion and experience, is the best core exercise. I'm feeling it already. How'd your core feel when you were only doing yoga? It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. I increased a tremendous amount of flexibility in my hips, which helps a lot of my imbalances. But at the same time, I, the strength wasn't there to maintain the new found mobility. So uh, it's gotta be it's gotta be a combination. If you're gonna do yoga, you, sh you should also do some form of strength training. Unless you take it off purposefully like I did. When you uh, when you were playing football, what was your 40 time? 434. I was 224 pounds and I ran a 434. And I'll tell you, the training that we did during that time was crazy. We basically power lifted and jumped. So like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, our coach had us doing squats, deadlifts, power cleans, presses. But then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we were on the stadium stairs all day long, sprinting up jumping up, skipping up, sideways up, backwards up. We just spent all this time up on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the stairs. And then he would have us do broad jumps and, and vertical jumps. And I tell you, man, that was, the, that was the fastest and most explosive I ever was. This guy wants to know if it's worth doing a hybrid program, like strength training, and mixing in bodybuilding, or just doing one or the other. Not only do you think it's worth it, it's what I, it's just the way I train. I always train with a mix of strength, hypertrophy, power, speed. The way you guys see me training is hybrid training. So even this five by five routine, it's hybrid in that the parameters aren't fully power lifting and they're not fully bodybuilding. It's the frequency and the, uh, the volume of bodybuilding, but the intensity of power lifting. So the way I see it is you should always be hybrid training especially if you're an athlete that requires hybrid uh, abilities like football and whatnot. Do you think you'd be more uh, aesthetic if you just did bodybuilding training than you uh, were when you were in your peak? If I were to really do bodybuilding, like compete in bodybuilding, I'd hire a coach because the truth is I probably don't know half the techniques that are associated with just aesthetic training. My training all comes from performance and strength. So when I say I'm doing hypertrophy or bodybuilding, it just means I'm changing the parameters. But the way the exercises are done, a bodybuilder like who is an expert in posing and flexing would probably have a, would definitely uh, be a better choice to figure those things out than to, than to ask me. You want to get stronger and more powerful, I'm your guy. But if you want to have that, those uh, bodybuilding cuts and curves and stuff, somebody who trains that way would be the best. I was watching um, a documentary with Kai Green, and he spends like his, a part of his workout was just was flexing. He was in a room with a bunch of other bodybuilders. I think Charles Glass was there, coaching them, and the workout was flexing, just like squeezing, flexing. And I could see how that could support the aesthetic quality of the muscle. But um, I mean, for me, flexing is just doing this. <laughs> Ugh!
This dude wants to know, he just opened a gym. What's your best advice for his brand new gym? Well, when I first opened my gym, I had two objectives. One was to pay the overhead with people who were local customers. And the other objective was to get people from all around the world to come to my gym. So the first one is probably the one that's going to give you the best bang for your buck right now. And the strategy that worked best, two strategies that work best for getting your local clientele built, built up. Number one is referrals. If you've got one client, they should bring another client. You should have them bring it, bring a client and, uh, and, and give them a gift. Give them a, a, a prize or give them some sort of uh, compensation for getting their friend to join. So that's really important. And the second one was, I would just put signs up on the highway. <laughs> Straight up, I remember hopping out my van. We drive all the way up to Clearwater and back. Just hopping out the van, putting signs, putting signs, putting signs. People would call me. It was all to my cell phone. They call my cell phone, leave a message. I call them back, invite them in for a workout. That's how I built up most of my clients. This motherfucker, like, is he trying to ruin our video? <clears throat> the sign. The sign should be real simple. So it should be very clear about what it is that you're offering. So for me, at one point, it was strength training for football. So all I wrote was strength training for football with a phone number. Don't put your fucking website, because nobody's checking out websites while they're driving, but they can call while they're driving. You know, more, more people will do this while they're calling than, you know, while they're driving than trying to look at websites and click the button and shit. So get them to call and leave a message, and then you can follow up with them. That's the most important thing. You follow up with them. Don't expect them to call you and sign up. Well, actually, you know what? I want to do it sideways. <laughs> what, with shoulders? Yo, I, I, I almost wanted to tell you to take that shit out because it looks so scary. <laughs> it's like, damn, that's fucked up. For somebody in their 30s to get rid of this and bulk up, I've heard that it's absolutely impossible once you get into your 30s and 40s. She's talking about that, that arm fat. Can you get rid of that arm fat when you're in your 30s or 40s? All right, well, generally speaking, getting rid of body fat gets a little tougher as you get older. But it doesn't mean you, it's impossible. It doesn't mean you can't. What you really need to pay closer attention to is your hormone levels. Hormones start shifting based off of years of abuse and toxicity. So if you're really committed to getting the body fat off, I would say have like a full assessment done and find out if you're balanced hormonally as well as following a diet and training. Because you could follow a diet and train your ass off, but if you're, you're low in certain hormones or too high in others, then uh, you're kind of just spinning your wheels. So it becomes more of a physiological factor rather than just uh, you know, eating right and exercising. Give yourself, give yourself a year minimum. I'm not making fun of you, but looking at you, it's gonna take, give yourself like two years to get where you wanna get. You know, just, that's just being, that's just being, I hate to use the word realistic, but you gotta be fucking real. It takes time. You get your hormones checked, you just go get a blood test? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can uh, you can contact Dr. Kalish, who I've used quite a few times, to test your uh, your adrenals. That's usually the first place to, to begin, is with your adrenals, and then uh, and then from there he can do a whole female profile on you. 
And, uh, and for men, it's testosterone levels start to drop. A lot of times testosterone levels drop, again, because of years of abuse, toxicity, and poor lifestyle choices that catch up on you. So it's not like you need testosterone shots the minute you turn 35. You just actually need to be more conscious of the way you're living your life, getting more sleep. You can't stay up partying. You can't be watching TV and eating potato chips. You got to take better care of yourself as you get older. So that's really the case. Dude, what was your uh, favorite moment in Strongman? My favorite moment in my Strongman competition days was when I beat Dave Beers in a 50 feet farmer's carry sprint with about 300 pounds per hand. And he went fast as hell and I beat him by like half a second. So that just felt real good. That was just a local competition, but, uh, but I was really jacked up to win that day. Asu said, how did, how did you and Danny meet? Well, I met Elliot, I was skateboarding to work <laughs> downtown. I worked at like a cigar bar slash uh, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like like the bar. And, uh, and let's see. Oh, Ryan, Ryan asked if I could do videos. I'm like, of course I can do videos. And uh, he's like, yeah, if you can make me some dope videos, man, I'll hook you up. Ryan said that? Well, no, you said that. Oh, I told you that. Yeah, yeah. Ryan introduced oh, me yeah. to you. Oh, yeah, I needed like, help. He's like, hey, my buddy Danny can do videos. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, if you can make me some dope videos, man, I'll hook you up. And I'm like, all right. So I kind of played it off. I didn't really know who you were. And I never ended up doing it. I never, like, came through because I was working so much. Yeah. And then I ended up doing a video for Chris. And you're like, oh, it's a dope video. So you had me start doing videos for you. And then I just started doing videos. Yeah, man. Yeah. Match made in heaven. <laughs> This guy said I can, uh, he just started doing pull-ups, but he can only do three or four. Well, it's an alternative, like an alternative exercise to help his pull-ups. Oh, when I was in high school, I didn't have a pull-up bar, but I had a barbell. And I would do bent over rows like I'm doing right now. And I did bent over rows, every, you know, during my workouts. And then when I went back to school for the physical fit, uh, fitness test, I did like twice as many chin-ups. So, I mean... Developing the musculature associated with pulling is going to help you whether you're pulling vertically or horizontally. So build up your bent over rows also, one arm rows, any kind of rows, even working your biceps will develop your pull up. And then of course, keep pulling up. Also your exercise frequency. I remember also we had a, uh, in my living room, we had, my dad hated when we did this, but we had moldings around the doorway. Whenever my brother and I would pass through, we could hop up on the molding, and bang out like three, four, five chin-ups and then just go about the rest of the day. Every time we walk past through that door, boom, boom, boom. So I mean, by the end of the day, we could have repped out maybe a hundred chin-ups, but we didn't feel it because it was, brought, it was broken up throughout the entire day. So that might be one thing to consider also. Don't think it's just during your workout that you're developing your pulling strength. Just throughout the day, just bang out a, full ch a few chin-ups. You'll see that frequency will add to your strength. This guy wants to know, like, he's 16 years old. What do you think, like, a decent max deadlift would be at 16? At 16, I was able to build up to a 315 deadlift. And a lot of the kids that end up training here, especially football players, they can build up to a 315. That's usually the first goal, I say, for most young athletes to build up to with regard to the deadlift, is you should be able to get 315. So if that's not what you're getting right now, that's fine. I would say that's just a pretty good goal to aim for. Place, right? mm -hmm. Yeah, there are certain milestone weights, you know, and they always associated with adding another 45 plate. But like first time you put a 45 plate on, right? Like that's a, that's a tremendous feat. I got a big plate on there. I remember <laughs> the first time I put on a big plate. Man, that's incredible. And then it's when can you put on two big plates? Big plates. And it's just a matter of growing up and putting more big plates on the bar. I feel like I was fucking the man when I finished 225, bro. Yep. I hit it twice. 
and I was like, it was like for weight training class, so like mm-hmm. he was there with the thing, and he was like proud of me and shit. I was like, yeah. Because it's not even about the weight, it's about their two big plates. Yeah, There's two of them on that motherfucker. <laughs> or four of them. How do you keep your grip strong and your wrists healthy? Keep your grip strong by lifting heavy shit with your hands. I mean, it's 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 as simple as that. Don't use straps. You know, you lift heavy weights with your hands. Use a, a, a two-inch bar. I like to use. Do farmers carries. You know, these are all just exercises that require your grip to get stronger. Hang from a damn bar. Just hang in there. Set up a clock in front of you and hang as long as you can. In fact, I found that by adding time to your tension with the grip increases your grip strength more than going real heavy you know I think it's just a, it's a matter of volume with grip uh, keeping your wrists healthy is a matter of keeping them flexible you know just like anything else your elbows your shoulders your knees I mentioned Jed Johnson in a video the other day his whole his, all his products and all his videos are about healthy hands and wrists and elbows and stuff like that because he bends nails and rips own books in half and shit like that. Yeah. So that shit people ask Elliot. Thanks for watching. See you next week.